Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation in the 2008 von Karman Lecture Series. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce our speaker, let me invite you to next week's von Karman Lecture, The Importance of Sample Return, about the Genesis mission. You can read about it in the, the flyers that are out on the counter. It returned samples from the solar, of the solar wind to Earth in uh, dramatic fashion. That'll be on April 24th here and April 25th uh, down at, Pacific, at uh, Pasadena City College. Places in our solar system that are known to have liquid water are rare. But the evidence Cassini has collected during flybys suggests that Saturn's little moon Enceladus could be one of those places. I recently heard a TV uh, newscaster pronounce it enchiladas. <laughs> Our speaker tonight will show you huge icy, icy geysers continuously erupting from the south polar region of Enceladus. Imaging and compositional data from Cassini's close flybys may provide clues to understanding how these geys <coughs> geysers originate. Tonight's speaker, Amanda Hendricks, is a research scientist at JPL. She's a member of the Asteroids, Comets, and Satellites group. She received her BS in aeronautical engineering from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and her master's from uh, University of Color Col <coughs> Colorado at Boulder. Her PhD work there included analysis of ultraviolet spectroscopic data of the Earth's moon and Jupiter's moon Europa, and she continued her research with UV spectroscopy as a focus, studying the moons of Jupiter, including sulfur dioxide on Io, radiogenic products on the surfaces of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and studying water ice on Saturn's moons. Amanda also uses ultraviolet spectroscopy to study space weathering effects on asteroids and the moon. She was a co-investigator on the Galileo ultraviolet spectro spectrometer team and is a Cassini ultraviolet imaging spectrograph team member. She's also a member of the Cassini science planning team. Amanda also runs re research programs as a principal investigator for NASA. And she likes to water ski and will be planning to skydive for the first time on her birthday. In 2006, Amanda received the JPL Lou Allen Award for Excellence. Please help me give a warm welcome to our excellent guest, Dr. Amanda Hendricks. Thanks, Dave. And thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Let me bring up my presentation here. <clears throat> so I'd like to tell you the story of Enceladus tonight and uh, start by going back from what we first learned about Enceladus from early on in history and then take you through time to um, what we know about Enceladus from the most recent flyby um, from the Cassini spacecraft, which just happened last week. Why do we want to study Enceladus? It's a very interesting body, but one of the reasons that it's so interesting is because it's so little and icy, and it's just so unexpected that so much activity would be happening here. It was discovered in, uh, let's see, 1789, I think, by Herschel. And that was about 100 years later than some of the other icy moons of Saturn were discovered, like Rhea and um, Dione. And this is because it's small, for one thing, but it also orbits in pretty close to Saturn. It's only about uh, four Saturn radii out from the planet. So when you're looking from Earth at a small body that's close in to a bright planet and the bright rings, it's hard to actually distinguish it from the body. So it wasn't discovered until a little later when uh, telescope technology got to be a little bit more sophisticated. Um, I was talking about how it's a small body. Here's Enceladus compared with some of the other moons in the solar system. Um, here's Enceladus. It's only about 500 kilometers across. 
And here's the Earth's moon uh, to scale. And so um, Enceladus is only about 15% of the um, size, diameter-wise, of the Earth's moon. So it's very small. Here, uh, just for comparison, Rhea, Tethys, Mimas, Iapetus, and Dione are some of the other icy moons of Saturn that we study with Cassini. And here, of course, is Titan, which is characterized um, by its very thick atmosphere, so we can't actually see through to the surface with our eyes. Titan is um, bigger than the Earth's moon, but it's actually the second biggest moon in the solar system. So we're studying Enceladus because it has intriguing characteristics, and we've known this for a while. One of the first um, things that's intriguing about it is its high albedo. Oh, here we go. Um, I, and that means that it reflects a lot of the light that hits its surface, actually almost 100%. It's very bright. And this has been known since early on, after its discovery. For comparison, the Earth's moon reflects about 8% of the light that hits it. And we're talking about, um, you know, we look at the moon and it looks pretty bright to our eye, but actually, since it's made out of rocky material and not water ice, it's pretty dark. So Enceladus is made of water ice. Um, it's not completely made of water ice. We know that it's denser than water ice would be, so we know that it, there's rocky material um, interior, but the surface is primarily water ice, so that helps it be very bright. Um, we also know that Enceladus orbits at the densest part of the E-ring, and this is interesting. I'll tell you why. So the E-ring, we all know the main rings of Saturn. They're beautiful and fabulous. Um, here they are up close. This is the A ring, the outermost of the main rings. Um, the Enki gap is within the A ring. Then you have the B ring going in. And the Cassini division divides the A ring and the B ring. And then the C ring. And, and inside, here's the planet in here, inside is actually the D ring. So they were named uh, going in. And then more rings got discovered. For instance, this is the very thin F ring. The E ring, uh, I'll show you in this artist's conception, is out here. And it's, it's more um, diffuse and broad. And you have to really stare for a long time before you can see it. But it's out here. And this is where Enceladus orbits, right in the middle of the densest part of it. But the E ring actually um, covers, um, e, e ring material actually extends from Mimas all the way out to past Rhea. So let me go through this a little. Here's the planet in the main rings. Here's Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, and Rhea. And the E-ring is densest at the orbit of Enceladus. So that is something curious. Uh, we've always thought, um, is there some relationship between Enceladus and the E-ring? Uh, also, we've known since the Voyager days that there are very few craters on Enceladus compared to other uh, moons that uh, we've studied. This is a Voyager image from the early 80s. And we can see that there are broad swaths of uh, terrain where there's barely any craters at all. It's very unique. There are regions that are pretty cratered. But then there's entire regions that don't have any craters at all. And that's very unique. You know, you think about our own moon or other moons uh, that you've seen images of in the solar system, and they're pretty heavily cratered. So all of these characteristics uh, suggest that it's a young surface. That means that it is um, probably being resurfaced by some sort of geologic process. And maybe there is some current or recent geologic activity happening, which is pretty interesting because it, um, there aren't that many bodies in the solar system that exhibit such activity. <clears throat> so as early on as 1981, this uh, artist's conception appeared in National Geographic, suggesting that there were some sort, some sort of cryovolcanism or geysers appearing on Enceladus, because we knew even since the Voyager days that something funny was going on there. So what other bodies do we have in the solar system that are geologically active? Earth. The Earth. <laughs> um, here's a geyser on Earth called Old Faithful. What else? We have Io. Io is this moon of Jupiter that's actually the most volcanically active body in the solar system. This is a gorgeous uh, color Cassini, uh, sorry, Galileo image of Io. 
almost everything that you see on the surface, all the different colors and all the different features are related to volcanic activity. And then, of course, we have this plume here on the limb that you can see. This is a nice sort of animated um, image from the New Horizons um, spacecraft that just flew by the Jupiter system about a year ago. And you can see this very dramatic Tvashtar plume up in the northern hemisphere there. And then there's another plume down here, too. Triton is another body that exhibits cryovolcanism. This is the moon of um, Neptune, and it has polar caps, actually, this strange cantaloupe terrain, and a tenuous atmosphere that is probably fed by um, cryovolcanic processes. And finally, we have Europa. Now, we can't say for sure that Europa is currently active, but it sure um, has some terrains that look like they've been at least recently um, moved around by some sort of process here. This is what we call the chaotic terrain or the chaos region, and it really looks like there's blocks of material that have been tilted up by um, subsurface motion, maybe of a subsurface ocean here. Um, so there's cracks all over the surface, and all of these surface features and different colorations make us think that something could be happening on Europa today, um, causing um, subsurface ocean material to upwell through the surface and, and get extruded onto the surface. Um, we don't know for sure, though. So this is a pretty exclusive club. Um, I'll also mention, of course, that Mars and Venus have um, extinct volcanoes. But this is a very exclusive club for Enceladus to think about joining. So it's exciting. OK, so now we're into the Cassini era. We know that Enceladus is a very interesting target. And um, now we have this spacecraft launched in 1997 on its way to Saturn. This, here's the Cassini um, model right over here. It's the half size, so it's actually twice as big. and. Um, it was launched in 97 and it arrived in um, 2004. So we've been there for almost four years. And one of the main goals of the mission was to study Enceladus. So what we did was we planned out a tour of the uh, Saturnian system with three targeted flybys. Uh, here's another uh, graphic showing a couple of sides of the, um, the Cassini spacecraft. The instruments that are on the orbiter um, include cameras. There's four cameras, the, the visible cameras that we um, normally see images of, uh, a near-infrared instrument, which is called VIMS, and a far-infrared instrument, which is called SEERS. And you'll hear me talking about these instruments. And so, of course, the infrared is uh, longer wavelengths than the visible. And in particular, the SEERS instrument is used to measure uh, temperatures, very important at uh, Enceladus. The UVIS is the ultraviolet uh, instrument on Cassini, and that, of course, measures ultraviolet wavelengths, which are shortward of what our eye can see. Then we have the MAPS instruments, or magnetospheric and particle science instruments. There are six of them, and they measure basically ions, neutrals, and different charged particles that um, make up the magnetosphere and also the environment around Enceladus. Um, in particular, you'll hear me talking about the INMS, which is the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. The magnetometer is another thing that's made key measurements at Enceladus. And then also on board, we have radar and RSS, or uh, radio science subsystem. <laughs> so I told you we, had, we have three targeted flybys planned for the prime mission, which is uh, July 04 to June 2008. The first targeted flyby was March 9, 2005. And that was at a distance of 500 kilometers. And we got interesting looks at Enceladus. Again, we can see a sparsely cratered um, object, but that there's, I don't know if you can see very well from out there, if it's kind of washed out, but there are color variations. Now, this is a false color image, but it's been enhanced to show color variations. Um, there are cracks in different sort of um, regions that seem to show, that uh, appear bluish um, when it's in a false color mode. And, um, that seems to indicate larger grain materials, probably. One of the other, besides imaging, on that March 9th flyby, we did a stellar occultation 
with the ultraviolet instrument. And what that means is that we stared at a star as it passed behind Enceladus. And we watched the signal, and if there's any sort of atmosphere around the body, then the starlight is going to diminish as it's absorbed by that, uh, the atmospheric gases. And so this is a very sensitive technique for measuring gases around bodies. Um, so we did this measurement, and the stellar signal did not decrease as we approached the body at all. It dropped right off like a rock just as soon as we hit the limb of the body. And so that tells us there's no gases around the body at this location here. So no, no atmosphere at Enceladus. Strangely, though, and this is sort of interesting and frustrating, the magnetometer measured that the um, magnetic field of Saturn was perturbed around Enceladus, suggesting that there's some sort of material, some sort of gases, neutral gases around Enceladus that are sort of causing the uh, magnetic field lines to drape around the body. So this was really interesting because the ultraviolet instrument didn't measure any gases around the body, and yet the magnetometer measured uh, the inference of gases around the body. So this was a mystery for a little while. Um, but the other thing is, is that this was su such an intriguing result, and there was a, also a flyby that I didn't mention. It wasn't a targeted flyby, but it, was, but it was a pretty close flyby in February of 05, a month before this one. And the mag team, the magnetometer team, used the data from that flyby and this flyby to get this result. And they were really um, interested in this. And they convinced the project that the next flyby that was going to happen in July of 05 needs to be closer. It was planned to be, I think it was supposed to be 1,000 kilometers from the surface. And the magnetometer team said, we've got to investigate this more. And we can't do it from 1,000 kilometers. We have to be. Um, closer to 200 kilometers from the surface. So we had between April, when the MAG team came up with this result, and July to say, wow, we got to change the trajectory of the spacecraft. And that is non-trivial. But we did it. And boy, are we glad that we did it. Because on the, thir on the second targeted flyby, July 11 of 05, we really hit the jackpot. The trajectory was lowered to 172 kilometers. So um, the spacecraft team that worked so hard to change the trajectory and everything that went along with it really needs to be congratulated and thanked for doing that so successfully. What happened was we flew by on a very inclined trajectory and we came up underneath the South Pole and got a very good look at the South Pole. And this is what we're looking at right here. The South Pole is basically centered on this um, cracked terrain that we refer to as the Tiger Stripes. We got a, a kind of a glimpse of these from the previous flyby. You can kind of see like just this area here. But now we, we see them straight on. And that's really, this is a unique feature. You don't see this every day in the solar system. So we know something funny is going on there, right at the South Pole. Even more intriguing, though, was the Sears results. So again, we flew, flew up right underneath the South Pole, and Sears was able to measure the temperatures of the surface there. What they expected was something like this on the left here, where they'd have uh, increased temperatures measured near the subsolar point. And then, of course, the poles are cold. So it would be cold down at the pole. Um, and by the way, they predicted that the maximum temperature would be about 80 Kelvin. So that's um, about uh, minus 300 Fahrenheit. So still, still pretty cold. but. Um, and then at the poles, it would be probably minus 350 Fahrenheit or something. Instead, what they measured was this. Um, not only was the hottest region not at the subsolar point, it was at the south pole, and it was a lot hotter than they thought it was going to be. So that was really interesting. And you can get a, uh, a closer up view uh, found that the hottest spots seem to correlate. And this is still pretty low resolution, but you could uh, kind of see that the hottest spots correlated with these stripes. And these are temperatures here in Kelvin uh, for each of these Sears pixels. <clears throat> so that was certainly interesting. And another, this is again a, a sort of a coarse resolution Sears map of the South Pole. 
So we're looking straight onto the South Pole here, and you can kind of see in the image, the visible image in gray underneath, and here's these tiger stripes. There's, there's basically four that we talk about along here. And the different colors refer to different Thier's temperatures. And um, again, the resolution is sort of coarse, but the hottest temperatures that they measure in the orange and, and red lie on top of these tiger stripes. Um, so let's see, I should have pointed this out, but the red arrows here you know, kind of guide your eye where the tiger stripes are. And the hot spots that Sears measures, the hottest regions, uh, are labeled here. Here's D, C, B, G, E, F. And, and we'll come back to those. So this is really an interesting result. Also, remember the purple magnetometer graphic that I showed you from the first flyby. Now the mag guys, the instrument got so close that they could actually say the neutral gas that they uh, used to think was probably global because of the lower resolution from the for, uh, more distant flyby, now they can tell it must be concentrated at the South Pole. So even just from mag results, this is the kind of picture that they came up with. And this is super lucky and serendipitous, but we did another UV stellar occultation on this flyby, and we watched the star pass right behind the South Pole. And not knowing that anything was going to be happening at the South Pole, that's just where the occultation happened. And sure enough, the measurement, the star measurement, the stellar signal drops off as we get in close and, and then completely drops off when we hit the limb. But this uh, attenuation of signal tells us that we have encountered some um, gas, some vapor. And, this and since we didn't appear on the previous flyby, that tells us well, it must be a localized atmosphere. So everything is really kind of hanging together. Now, what is the composition of that gas? The, the UV instrument can, could tell that it was water vapor. It was primarily water vapor. And that result was backed up by the INMS that I mentioned, the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. Um, who can measure other species too, a lot more species than the UVIS instrument. And they said, yes, it's primarily water. There's also some CO2, some nitrogen, methane, probably some CO, and trace amounts of other species like hydrocarbons. So this is really exciting. <clears throat> Let's see. Now, we, so this is, first of all, Let's just step back and think about how crazy this is that there's this gas coming out of the South Pole and the, out of a big hot spot on the South Pole. But we still, it doesn't look like anything to the eye. The images didn't show us anything. And that's because the geometry wasn't quite right. But later that year in November, we had the opportunity to be pretty close to Enceladus. It wasn't a targeted flyby, but we were pretty close. And it was also high phase. So we're just seeing the crescent of the moon. And that's the perfect opportunity to see dust particles. Um, like when you see smoke, for instance. And now we can measure the plumes. Uh, they're backlit, and so and these very small particles forward scatter, and so the, they're being backlit, backlit, and this is the best opportunity to see them. And even more interesting is now we can see that it's not just a big plume, but it's a big plume made up of small jets that uh, seem to be coming from very specific sources and pointed in slightly different directions. So, and in this geometry, also I should mention that we're looking sort of broadside to those um, tiger stripes. Now, oh, and this is basically a stretched out version of that image here. So you can see uh, the, the gas, or the plume, um, sorry, the ice jets are down in here, and then if you really stretch it out, you can see the very fine contributions really um, extend all the way out to here. <clears throat> and I'll remind you also that the camera, those high phase images that I just showed you, that's showing us ice particles. So there's the plume is made up of different gases that can be seen by the UVIS and by the INMS, and the composition the composition and the density can be measured by those instruments, but the camera can actually measure the um, particles. 
And so we know that the plume is made up of different gases and then also ice grains. Now, uh, it turns out that the, the camera had actually measured or observed the plume you know, before the other instruments had back in January of 2005. But it was so unconvincing. You know, we, we just all kind of looked at these images and thought, is that an image artifact or something wrong with the camera? It just seemed really unbelievable to think, hey, look at that. But um, now, after, the, after November of 05, they could go back into the database and say, yeah, now we believe it. Now we think that's the plume. And then you can stretch it out and really uh, pull out the contrast there. Another example of an early plume image is here, back in February of 2005. So, and now, there's even more plume images. We look at Enceladus every opportunity we can at high phase. We want to see if it's changing. We want to see it at different angles to try to um, see where the jets are and how much um, ice they're putting out. And so what the, um, some of the researchers on the camera team have done is actually put together all those images and triangulated to find the exact sources of those jets. And so here we are looking at the, directly at the South Pole again, and here's our four tiger stripes. And by the way, um, the International Astronomical Union, I think uh, the IAU, which is in charge of naming everything in the solar system, uh, has said that all of the features on Enceladus are to be named after characters and places in the Arabian Nights. So the tiger stripes are called Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo, and Alexandria. And, and we'll hear about some other similarly named features, <laughs> too. But anyway, so, um, so you can triangulate and find the sources of the jets. And, um, and they're marked here by these uh, Roman numerals in yellow here. There's like eight or nine of them. And what's also shown here in red is the sources where Sears measured the hot spots in that one fly. But remember, we talked about um, A through F. And so we've, we do find that many of the jet locations measured by the camera correlate with uh, many of the hot spots. It's not a complete one-to-one -one correlation, but it's pretty good. Okay. So I'm waiting for this to advance. Okay, here we go. Um, so another thing that we've done more recently is another stellar occultation uh, with the UV instrument. And um, remember how I told you, okay, we had that one occultation that kind of went up here at kind of low latitude and measured no gas. And then the real jackpot was when we watched the star go right behind the uh, South Pole. And that was kind of a, a vertical crossing, though. It kind of went like that. Now what we just did in October of 2007 was we had the opportunity to watch this star pass in a horizontal path right below the limb, the South Pole limb of Enceladus. So this is, this is so perfect for looking at that plume and looking at the jets. Um, and, looking, and this will be the first time then that we can actually see gas jets, because remember, with the ISS, we're looking at particle jets. So here's the star passing right below the limb of um, Enceladus. And it's also perfect because it's not passing actually behind the disk. It's just pass, it's only being occulted by the, by the plume. And what we find is that, um, I hope you can see this graphic on the left. It shows you, this is versus time. So it's basically the density of the plume as the star goes through. And so as the star kind of hits the plume, it gets denser, denser, denser. Oops, there's some wiggles in there. I wonder what those are. And then it goes out of the plume. And so what we find is that these wiggles in here can be pretty well uh, characterized by jet locations. And so on top of a broader gas plume, this broader shape here, we also see jets of gas coming out. And we can kind of uh, correlate those with the particle jets that have been um, detected by the camera. Um, if, if you can, the, um, the viewpoint of the UVIS was kind of along this direction here. So we kind of can't tell in this direction where they are, but we know that they must line up somewhere along here. And this first um, jet here lines up with these. Remember, look in yellow here for the um, particle jets, lines up with these particle jets 
the second gas jet lines up with this um, particle jet and so forth. So there's about four of them. So this is really interesting. So now we're starting to put together a lot of the vapor and a lot of the particle stuff. And I'll also go back and remind you that um, one of the interesting things about Enceladus was that it orbits at the densest part of the E-ring. And we also can see now it actually contributing to the E-ring. Um, this is a very high phase image. So the sun was, um, th this is basically Enceladus in shadow here. And again, I don't know how well you can see this, but Enceladus is um, dark. It's a very tiny dot here. And so much of what you can see here is backlit, very fine grains, both in the plume right below Enceladus and in the broader E-ring. And you can see um, sort of tendrils of material coming off Enceladus and being deposited basically in the E-ring. So it's pretty fabulous. So what is the deal here? This is a crazy situation here. We have um, lots of heat and crustal deformation that is seen at the South Pole. Um, what is the power source there? We have jets of gas and ice um, coming from these South Polar cracks. What is the jet source? These are all questions that we have to try to answer with the data sets that we have. And also, why is it only at the South Pole? What a bizarre place to have cryovulcanism. So let's um, think about what people have been doing with the data sets. The heat source, tidal heating is a pretty good um, resource for heating. Tidal heating comes when, a, um, when an object is in orbit around another one and it's in an eccentric orbit. So it's not quite circular. And, um, and so as a result, the body will get um, stretched out. And this happens with the Earth's moon. The Earth, uh, well, that's why the Earth has tides. And, it's, and the moon actually has a tidal bulge to it, too, uh, because of the pull of the uh, Earth's gravity on it. And so what happens is that the, the body that's in orbit in an, in an eccentric orbit gets uh, flexed and it creates heat on the inside from the uh, friction. Kind of like if you squeeze a tennis ball or some other squishy ball, it gets kind of warm. So, um, so you've got frictional heat in there. Now Enceladus is in an orbital resonance with Dione, that moon that um, two moons out, it's in a two to one resonance. So that's what keeps it in this eccentric orbit. Now, it's probably, the, the amount of tidal heat though that's generated is probably not enough um, to explain the, the, the amount of heat that we're seeing now. Um, what probably happened is that there was some sort of heat generated early on in the history, and then the tidal heating is enough to just keep it going. Um, probably the leading theory on that is that there was aluminum-26 present, which decays and produces heat. And so that produced enough heat initially to sort of kickstart that, and then the tidal heating can keep the heat up. So it's probably enough heat on the inside then to um, create this heat that we measure then coming out the surface. What about the plumes themselves? Where can that vapor and gas, the, where can the vapor and the gas particles be coming from? Well, there's a few models out there now. Uh, one of the leading ones is from the imaging team. And they suggest that there's near surface um, liquid water. Okay, so there's some sort of an ice shell, and then below it, there's liquid water. And it's so hot that it's boiling, and it must be uh, fairly near the surface, and then you've got these cracks that we can see, and, and the water underneath is at high pressure, and it can, the pressure is released, basically, through the cracks. Um, you might have an ocean farther down, or some sort of a liquid source further down, but then frictional heating of the cracks will, um, will warm up the vapor and allow the plumes to um, be emitted as, as plumes, uh, sorry, plumes of um, vapor and particles. Um, this, this model here might not um, explain properly, though, the surface features that we see, the amount of activity along each of the tiger stripes. Uh, one other idea is that 
okay, maybe there isn't a subsurface ocean, but there are clathrates, which are molecules basically that act like a cage. So, and they can basically trap different gases. And if, so in the, in the lattice, so if the clathrate is decomposing, it can release the gas, and that would be the source of the water vapor. Uh, it doesn't quite do it, though, for the amount of water vapor that we see. And then finally, um, you might have, again, a water reservoir and um, the vapor condensing into the ice particles as it goes up the cracks. So none of these, um, we can't really say none of these or any one of these doesn't work yet. But notice that three of them require a subsurface ocean or a subsurface water source. So um, that's kind of the going theory right now. And this is sort of a graphic showing what that might look like. If you, this is for the first model where it's at actually boiling. Um, so you've got this pocket. It's pressurized. It's down deep enough that it's pressurized. And then you know, just so long as it has a vent to the surface, which uh, are those cracks, it's going to come up both in the form of vapor and particles. Notice down here that you have tidal heating to help uh, heat this and keep this liquid under here. Now, why does it end up being at the South Pole? Well, this is actually where it's um, dynamically going to end up. If you have a pocket or an intrusion or what's called a diapir of low density material, like um, you know, a water pocket, um, if it originally maybe started at a lower latitude, it's actually going to reorient Enceladus because it wants to um, it, it's most dynamically stable along the spin axis. So this is where we actually would expect it. Um, but the tectonic patterns that we see on the surface, the different cracks and stress fractures that we see, are actually consistent with such a reorientation having happened. Uh, if there is this low density anomaly down here, which we would expect if there's a subsurface ocean or a pocket of uh, liquid water, um, it might be detectable by Cassini. And so what we might want to do at some future time is do a close flyby underneath the South Pole and compare the uh, mass determination with one from a low latitude flyby. So let me tell you that um, this, the second flyby that we did, the July 2005, where we discovered all of the activity, it was called the E2 flyby. It had a trajectory that looked about like this. And this, is, this plot here, and I'm going to show you a few of these, so I'll explain it. It's um, symmetric about this axis right here. So this is Enceladus. And here's the plume coming out of the South Pole. And the trajectory for E2, remember I said we came in over the South Pole. Um, since this is, you know, we kind of came in, swooped over the South Pole, and actually kind of kept going up. Um, now, um, so by the way, Here's the plume. Here's a, this is um, basically the um, dust plume here, stretched out. So you can see that we kind of barely just went through there. We kind of nipped it. And already, we could get good um, measurements on the composition and the density. Now, we just had another flyby last week, and we decided to get bold, and we went like that. We didn't actually bounce. It just kind of went, went going just like that. So. Here's what we flew in from the north all the way through. Our closest approach was at um, close to the equator at about 50 kilometers. So remember, our closest approach before was at 172. So we're really feeling brave, and we went uh, 50 kilometers. The important thing is that it, it got us a lot deeper into the plume. Now still, we, decided we were being a teeny bit conservative because initially we were going to go 25 kilometers away. And that would have put us even deeper into the plume. But then we decided, well, let's back off just a little bit and make sure we understand the plume a little bit more before we go that deep in. But still, this was uh, really exciting. And 50 kilometers from the surface, that's uh, closer than we've gotten to anything in the Saturn system. So it's, it's um, really exciting. Now, this is a flyby. This was the third Enceladus flyby. I told you there were three in the prime mission. It just happened last week. So it's known as E3. And in this flyby, we're focusing on sampling the plume and um, um, on south polar temperature measurements. So we're, we come in 
Uh, we, we do some observations of the North Pole, and I'll talk more about this. And then what we do is we, we're doing a big turn. We're not uh, pointing the cameras at the surface the whole time. It's a very fast flyby, by the way. If we were trying to take images of the surface through the whole time, they'd just be smeared, and we wouldn't be able to track the uh, body the whole time and everything. So what we do is we're doing a turn, and we orient the spacecraft so that the INMS, the neutral and um, mass spectrometer, can basically taste and smell and touch the, the plume material and measure it and say, what's it made out of when it's going in here like this? So this is really exciting. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the results, but not all of them, if my computer will wake up. OK. OK, so I'm going to show you a movie um, of the, <coughs> to show you the geometry. OK, hang on just a sec. Sorry about this. I can't find it on here. OK, I'm going to show you this movie. OK. Uh, I'm actually having a little problem here because I can't see the whole thing, so I can't stop it and start it. Um, but look at this. Here, this is showing you what Cassini is doing. And so we start out very far away from Enceladus, and we're getting in closer and closer. But this shows you, OK, we're looking with the cameras. We're taking pictures. Now we turn, and we're doing a radar scan. Um, the radar is oriented 90 degrees from the cameras. Then we turn back. We're still inbound, and we're taking more pictures. And we're doing scans with the UVIS, and the SEERS is doing temperature maps of the North Pole. We're getting in closer and closer. And now we're doing the big turn. And we're orienting the spacecraft so we can do the in situ particle measurements. Whoop, there goes closest approach. And then we do a turn and point again at the South Pole. And now SEERS is taking over and doing temperature maps. We do a little radar again, and then we do SEERS again. And we're going to end with a, a UVIS um, compositional map. Um, now, what this movie didn't show you is that right at closest approach, or right very close to closest approach, Enceladus actually went into eclipse. So it went into the shadow um, of Saturn, basically. And this was actually ideal. Because when Sears is looking at the South Pole right after closest approach, uh, it's, nobody else actually wants to look. The cameras don't want to look because you can't see it. Uh, but it's perfect for Sears because there's no influence of the sun to heat up the surface at all. All they're looking at is the temperature that's coming out of the inside of Enceladus. So it's perfect, actually. OK. There was the movie. So I said, I told you that the um, inbound, we took images of the North Pole, and this is what it ended up looking like. Um, this is, um, you can see that the phase angle is maybe um, 100 degrees or 90 degrees or something. But this is um, cratered terrain. We had seen it with Voyager a little, uh, but not at this good of resolution. And over here, actually, this terrain here, we hadn't really seen with Voyager uh, very well at all. So this is. Um, the best resolution um, North Polar imaging that we have right now. It's interesting to compare it to the South Pole, which, as we know, has very few craters. Um, actually, no craters on the South Pole. Um, so this is cratered, but it's not completely cratered. Look at this swath over here and this swath over here that um, exhibit very few craters, and they look like they've been tectonically disrupted. These craters in here, this one is called Aladdin, I think, and this one's called Alibaba. They, um, I'm not kidding, <laughs> um, they look funny. They look like um, they hit a surface that maybe was a little slushy or something. Like there's evidence there for some sort of heating of the surface um, at some point in the, in the past. And it looks like it's been tectonically disrupted. But certainly nothing like what we see on the South Pole. So this will be a source of um, further study, uh, further comparisons with the um, South Pole. Now, Sears. 
um, is one of the stars of the show of this flyby. And this is, again, in the gray image in the back is our image of the South Pole that we've looked at a few times. And we can see the tiger stripes here, along here. And superimposed on that is this temperature map that Sears measured um, from the, the, the July 2005 second targeted flyby. Um, with the contours showing the temperature ranges. And this is a, kind of a different one than I showed you before, but basically um, what I want to show you here is that the best resolution that Sears had in the previous flyby was about 25 kilometers. So, so their pixel was about this big here. In this flyby that we just did last week, they're going to get such good resolution, or they got such good resolution. Their pixels were like this big. It was like 10 kilometer resolution. So they're going to be able to resolve the tiger stripes. They're going to be able to measure the temperatures along the tiger stripes. And it's really going to be great. <laughs> OK, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> um, OK, uh, the other thing about this E3 flyby is that since we're going through the plume, the INMS that told us about the composition of the plume so nicely last time is going to be way deeper in the plume. And so its, it's resolution is, is much better. It's going to be able to tell us in much greater detail what the components of the plume are. So that's, that's really going to be exciting. <clears throat> now, we have more coming. We have another flyby planned that's coming up in August. And we're going to be even a little bit more daring next time uh, that's going to be called the E4 flyby. And we're going to be 50 kilometers from the surface there, too, but we're going to get a little bit more deeply into the plume. And on that flyby, we are going to focus on imaging. So, and this is important, let me tell you, too, because we need to get good images of the South Pole because um, before too long, the season's going to change on Enceladus. And the South Pole is getting more and more into darkness. Um, it's going to be winter in the south. And so we've got to do imaging while we can. Um, so on this flyby here, we're going to orient the spacecraft so that just, and again, this will be a fast flyby, but just as soon as we can, we're going to start taking images of the south pole and get the best resolution ever of those tiger stripes. And we'll get temperature information, too. So that'll be a really exciting flyby. This, and again, I don't know how well you can see this here, but here's our famous you know, tiger stripes. This um, line right here, and you can see that it's sort of stippled over here, uh, shows you where the terminator is. So this will be nighttime during that August flyby. And these little white boxes here, it starts little, and then it kind of gets bigger, bigger, bigger. This, is the this tells you about the imaging resolution. So this is the size of the narrow angle frame we'll get super good resolution down in here where we don't really have that good of resolution so far. And then as we, as we pull away, you know, the resolution will get worse and worse, but still great. Um, so this, is, this isn't for sure. Uh, we'll use the information from this past flyby, this last week, um, to decide exactly on the placement of these um, fields of view, but it'll be something like this. It'll be really great. So um, I encourage you to stay tuned. Because not only do we have the August E4 flyby, we have October E5, another one in October called E6. And then more later in the mission, E78, E9, E10. And we are getting bolder and bolder with every flyby. Because here's the ones that we already talked about. Later on, we're just going to go right on in and just cut through the densest part. Um, one thing I didn't, I didn't mention too much was that, you know, we, we kind of backed off a little on this last one and decided to be a little conservative. But we do care about the safety of the spacecraft, and we do uh, really spend a lot of time making sure that the spacecraft is going to be safe flying through here because there are dust particles, and we don't know. We don't want to have one that's big enough to really knock us out hit us. And so we spent a long, long time making sure that that wouldn't happen. And sure enough, any particle that's big enough to damage the spacecraft we have pretty good confidence isn't going to make it up you know, this high where we are. They're probably, um, if they even exist, if, if such particles exist, they are not making it very high up. So we have pretty good confidence that we're keeping the spacecraft safe. Uh, and we do want to go in in the future and make really good measurements close into the surface. So um, 
please uh, stay tuned and thank you for coming tonight and thanks for all of your support. Thanks, Amanda. And we do have some time for some questions. I'll let you pick the. Oh, okay. Any questions? Hi. Um, so, you would expect maybe even despite the low gravity, some deposits if there are some larger right. particles. Um, is the blueness you mentioned larger particles or larger material near the tiger strikes? Is that any evidence of broken or deposit? <laughs> material at the uh, volcanic fissures? Right. Um, so just to repeat the question in case people didn't hear it, um, you know, we, we looked at the blue stripes. In that false color image, the, the tiger stripes look blue, probably because of larger grains. Um, and why is that? Is that redeposited material or what? And we don't know, actually. It might be redeposited. It might also just be grains that have sintered together uh, so they become larger um, because of the heat. They sort of you know, grow and glom onto each other. It's, it's not clear. Um, so far, we're really not seeing any direct evidence of, although we're looking, and, and there might, there's some suggestion, but we're not really seeing any direct evidence of uh, fallout from the plume composition-wise, but we are definitely looking. Um, what we do see, probably, is very, uh, like, snow covering the surface, very fine-grained snow all over the surface. That's probably E-ring grains that basically coat the surface, because it orbits in the E ring, so all the E-ring grains hit it. And <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, Leo. So you mentioned that there are some results that you couldn't mention. Right? Yeah. Can we know about right. those results? <laughs> right, so we have really, really spectacular results from a flyby last week. And I am dying.